Hey guys, how you guys doing? This is Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Um, wow. So, alright. So I know, I know, we're ten minutes late. I get, I get where you're coming from on that. But, as the man was saying, I am Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer. And I'm saying, hey guys, welcome to the game gallery. Um, again, it, it's a weird thing. But, first I'd like to introduce my illustrious co-host... The Duggernaut. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's where... Ooh, let me see if I can get you, oh. get you a little less slouchy here. Oh, yeah, well, I, I can probably also just slouch yeah. less. Yeah, that works. That might help. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we're sitting up here and we're like, yeah, hey, you know, how's it going, blah, blah, blah. Oh, God, it's Sunday morning. Yeah, Sunday morning yeah. and we're, we're like here doing a thing. It's, it's very different from Sunday morning where you may just want to be lounging around. Yeah. <laughs> so... So yeah, we got some stuff lined up for you today. That we do. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, this is the game gallery where we talk about games, um, hobbies, aspects. We try and focus on types of games here in the gallery, um, not particular games, because I wanted to do that. I really wanted to. Mm -hmm. But you know what I learned? As soon as people start talking to someone who actually has a platform, People want to take over the platform. They're like, this is my favorite game, and you should dedicate three and a half months of broadcast to my favorite oh, game. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, Not that I don't that. want to, but I, I just I don't have the access to doing that. Um, got some exciting stuff coming out. We've had some we've had a couple of pretty awesome movies hit um hit the theaters this Friday. I speak, of course, about two new superhero movies. I'm so out thing. of the loop. I, th this kid thing has destroyed my popular culture. <laughs> so, hey. tell me as if I have no idea what is going on, because I have no idea what's going on. Look <laughs> it out. Um, well, this weekend, a movie I've been looking forward to a lot, mm -hmm. um, Aquaman. Oh, yes. Aquaman I did hear that one hit. was coming out. Yeah, yeah. Aquaman. Aquaman. Yeah, because I think I'm looking at Aquaman. It's, it's one of yeah. those things. Um, and um, we got good old Jason Momoa mm -hmm. doing the whole, look at me, I swim a lot, and I'm a bro <laughs> who's swimming after a redhead. Woo! Yeah! You know? Um, I mean, he's, he's a good-looking dude. Yeah, yeah, he is. He is. But um, it's funny. Um, we'll, we'll get into that a little while because I, I wanted to talk about um, a little bit of art instead of um, focusing on Exit this week. I wanted to focus on a couple of things I see in TV right. and movies and game art, which is which is an interesting thing. Um, but, you know, back to that though. Yeah, so Jason Momoa's hot. We know. Yeah. We I mean, know. We know he's just where he's been hot since Stargate Atlantis. <laughs> um, you know, he's just he's a great big beautiful Polynesian man, once again, who I'll never look like. Um <laughs> But um, and the second movie that came out was the CGI adventure of Spider Man I into heard the Spider Verse. This. I, yeah. yeah, I didn't realize it came out this weekend. But yeah, yeah, it came out yesterday. E everybody's been hyped on this movie coming out. Now it looks cool. Yeah, not gonna lie, I wanted to go see it. The thing is, it came out on Friday at Christmas break. Yeah. So there ain't even matinee tickets open in my town. Yeah. <laughs> They're just like, yeah, oh yeah, Spider Man into the. I'll, I'll see it in a few weeks. It's, it's cool. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah, that's just my life anymore, whether or not the movie's sold out. Yeah, I'll, I'll see it in a few weeks. And then a few weeks turns into, oh, hey, it's on Netflix. <laughs> Which is always depressing when it's like, oh, hey, that movie that I wanted to see in theaters is, uh, I see the DVD in Target now. Yeah. Cool. Well, I wildly miss that train. Hey, welcome to adulthood. Yeah. Um, one thing I will say, and this is, this is a really funny thing, is as you get older... Okay, um, I, I started thinking about this because, you know, um, I've got my issues as far as that stuff goes. But one of the things that I have come to notice is um, parents don't get what their kids do. They really don't. You know why? I mean, uh, you have to explain the statement first before I can answer well, that. Well, kids learn from other kids. And, sure. you know, that that's the number one thing. And since kids learn from kids and people learn stuff in their own environment, um, we're not part of that environment. 
So oh yeah, the the part where we're just out of touch all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh yeah. And oh, as yeah. I get older, I see myself falling further and further and further yeah. away. Now mine's in college. Yeah. So they use these emojis and and stuff. They were like, Careful, oh yeah, man, you're gonna. <laughs> Seriously, like there was um there was one moment where it was like blah blah blah. Oh yeah, that song is Bop. I'm like Bop. Yeah. That that is. I mean, I kind of get it since it's kind of from the origin of bebop and stuff. So I'm guessing that is um that is not a pejorative phrase, but it is a positive idiom of which you're you're showing admiration for something. You know, and my ears got really pointed. So yeah, <laughs> I just ugh, um I've I've always been quite versed in internet culture Mm -hmm. um, even compared to most people my age but the fact that the internet culture is leaving me behind i'm just like oh geez i just i can't right now i can't even (laughs) deal with the fact that the slang is changing in so many ways um and i'm sure it's always been this way i'm sure this is the the progression of how it's always been for people as they get older they see you know, the slang passed them by and the things that the kids nowadays are listening to and the music sounds terrible. And this, I'm like, uh, I have to assume that this is the natural order of things, but it's still jarring. It's still really jarring. Well, no, the truth is it is the natural order of things. It's just, it's our turn to be out of touch. We get the dad jokes. Um, and all the dad joke really is, and I'm letting you guys know, is something that was funny when we were younger, and we don't know it's not funny anymore. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I actually strongly disagree with that. Oh, really? A, a dad joke is a specific type of joke, and that type of joke has never changed since the invention of the dad joke. The dad joke is an anti-joke, where a joke is designed to, like, bring mirth to someone, to, to you know – Make them laugh and make them, you know, to spread good feelings and good cheer. A dad joke does the exact opposite. It steals mirth from that other person and gives it to you. It's it's a vampire joke. Just wait. Because, <laughs> see, here's the thing. You are now at the part of parenting, okay? And you are at a serious part of parenting where um, you're learning dad jokes and you don't know it. Oh, no, I, I'm well aware. I, that's the thing. It's uh, – you're, you're – you know the dad jokes that your dad told. The thing is, when I say it used to be funny, um, your kid is what, two going on three? Two and a half, yeah. Yeah, two and a half. So by the time your kid is maybe four, that kid is going to laugh at every joke. Oh, yeah. And most of the time a dad joke is the type of joke that a dad used to tell their kids, and their kids would be like, ah, seven, eight, nine, ha, 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 ha. And then comes the day where the kid doesn't think that joke is funny anymore and neither do their friends and then you look up and you and you say but she used to like puns yeah and her liking of puns made me like puns <laughs> now i like puns <laughs> oh my god i'm unfunny <laughs> you know and that that's really where where dad jokes come from yeah you know yeah i i can see that um, so it's not like the way that you're describing it is a dad joke is a troll. That that's what you're it, since it's an anti joke that steals levity and dads yeah. are sitting up twisting their mustaches going oh they like that MTV and that YouTube hey daughter how's it going by the way would you like a pancake because because I've got some birthday candles and a pan waka waka good. Good. She is now miserable. <laughs> but I think you've you've uh, you've hit on the exact right thing where uh, the dad joke initially may be a, a good thing when you're telling it to the small child, but mm-hmm. as that child grows up and you continue to tell that joke, uh-huh. the purpose of this joke shifts. You you know it's not funny, and you know that they're not going to enjoy it, but you know that you will, and you will enjoy the fact that they don't enjoy it. See, that's. Okay, I'm going to say you're either still gaining XP as a parent <laughs> well, or you're just yes. evil. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> little column A, little column B. Yeah, because yeah. I will tell you, I'll tell you as far as the dad jokes go, you're half right on the we will laugh at the joke because we think it's funny. Here's the other half, though. We don't do it to troll necessarily. It's just I'm going to tell a joke to make me laugh. 
you can join me if you want. Or you can groan. Either way, I'm laughing. It's not told with the intention to steal mirth. It is just supplying my them. own. You know? <laughs> yeah. See, I, I appreciate the groans. I, I draw strength from the groans. Oh. The goal is to elicit the groans. So you're evil. <laughs> yeah, I told you, a little groan, a little groan. Oh, that sounds like a lot of evil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel so sad. Hey, honey, come here. What? Oh. Your mom says I play too much. Uh, your mom used to say I play too much golf, so I solved the problem. I got you a new mom. Yes, I am powerful. See, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. Just, you draw the power from the misery that you cause by telling this terrible joke. It's ultimately a harmless joke, but oh, <laughs> you reap such delicious <laughs> rewards from their groans and tears. Mm. Yeah, I'm sorry, man. That's just that's <laughs> that's just bad. That's just evil. Uh, well, fair enough. And I mean that. that That is that's some evil stuff. Um, but I suppose we should get to the show. We should probably we talk should. about games at some point. Yeah, we gallery. should. Because the game that we're talking about right now is the game of parenthood. Yeah. The it's... parenting game where we draw joy from, well, the misery of our children. Um, it's true. Number one reason to have a kid is just to mess with them. See, I thought... Uh, I thought that the number one reason to have a kid was because you were tired of taking out the trash. Well, I haven't gotten to the point where I can actually, like, manipulate my little slave into doing most of my chores for me. I mean, sorry, <clears throat> my loving child whom I adore and don't try to constantly get to do my chores for me. I was about to say, watch it. Never, <laughs> ever, ever call anybody a slave in front of your black friend. Fair enough. Uh, my, indentured servant. I was, was going to say, my, uh, my unwilling indentured servant for life. Your um, unpaid intern. There we go. Yeah. However, how, how we, how we want to yes, euphemistically yeah. phrase uh, the modern capitalist interpretations of ancient, ancient institutions, <laughs> uh, we will go ahead and say that my daughter is not yet very good at doing chores. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. She, she's working on it. She's very enthusiastic. The, the enthusiasm level on that chart is high, and the ability to actually help is very low. And if you watch that graph, there will come an intersection where eventually, as they get better at doing chores, they get significantly less willing to do them, and then eventually they become teenagers. Right. Because, so. yeah, I um, I remember when I was a kid, I really, really, really used to enjoy scrubbing walls. Really? Yeah. A weird one, but all right. Well, it was immediate gratification. Okay. You know, it, it's the wall is dirty. Yeah. Scrub, scrub, scrub. The wall is not dirty anymore. I okay, could see, I see it. That. wasn't yeah. that hard. Not a big deal. Um, and eventually I got fascinated by the scientific aspect, um, which was if I scrub hard enough, the paint will go away. Hmm. And it was like, wow. You know, right. um, by the time I turned 11, I wasn't having that anymore. Okay. <laughs> I'm just like, why are we scrubbing the walls? Doesn't make any damn sense. We can just paint it. <laughs> you know that that's where I was. Yeah, I mean, there's there's something to be said for that. Um, the some kids I, I do think take to certain chores with more interest than others. I was <coughs> for whatever reason I always really enjoyed mowing the lawn. I enjoyed the like you just take this whole you know similar the idea like you, you take this whole thing you get that instant gratification of like well it was all messy and overgrown and then you just like run the lawn over it oh look at this nice and even and clean smells nice ah oh, love it yeah I, I never like the smell of fresh cut grass oh, I'm, yeah. I'm a city kid i like fresh port tar but um <laughs> no, 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 joke. <laughs> no I, I, <laughs> joke i, un I understand because i'm like i personally very much dislike the smell of tar but i can see the appeal if it's associated with good memories yeah um wouldn't go that far. It's associated <laughs> with memories? Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's associated with not bad ones. Mm. And that was the thing. Um, yeah. I, I never liked mowing the lawn. Never, never, never. One, I can't stand the smell of fresh cut grass. Mm. Um, and second, I wasn't a strong child. Ah. Which means I could never get the damn thing started. I'd be sitting up there pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling. I'm like, there's got to be a... Okay, wait a minute. So this thing is down here, and I'm pulling it, and if I pull it hard enough, it'll spin fast enough. Couldn't I just put a bolt on it, take a drill, and just zzz, now it's on? What's wrong? Why why can't this be push button? And, uh, yep, yeah, that's, again, that was me at six years old. Um, <laughs> and the big thing on that was there were push button ones. We were just too poor to afford them. Yeah. 
And I mean, I, I had a I had a crank lawnmower as well, you know. Yeah, and um, I I uh, solved that problem by um, installing some uh, like a little small pulley system, so less effort would get the thing going faster. Yeah, see, you were a standard scientist. I was <laughs> mad. I was I was mad. I wasn't even slightly annoyed scientist. I was pissed off scientist. Um, and um, the funniest thing, the funniest thing, was the first lawnmower that we had was one from the 1910s. Oh, okay. wow. We had one. This was pre-gasoline um, I was going to say, one of, the, one of the old push ones with the little rotary. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. I, yeah, we had one of those. And the, that thing, I loved. Yeah. I'm just like, I wait, I push this right? thing, and it goes, and look at all the spinning, and yeah. those are blades, and yeah, can it go over a toy, and yeah, can it go over, yeah. You know. Um, yeah, I, I, we, we had one of those for a while, too. I liked that thing. Yeah, yeah problem again i wasn't a very strong child <laughs> yeah it did require more strength yeah because you have to brute force it over an area yeah and you know what yeah. now especially since i'm greener than i used to be um environmentally um i kind of appreciate those even more now you know it's that's, i like, hadn't thought about that but that's a that's a solid point yeah um, um it's especially like we're adults i'm an angry person and as every day passes, I find I can't yell, I can't scream, I can't throw stuff. I can't even look angry, you know, and I'm like, maybe I should buy a house in one of those push things where it's like, you know, something happens, you get into an argument with your boss over the phone, then you just go out and mow the lawn, mow See, the lawn. You're, you know? you're, you're unlocking the secrets of suburbia and how, yeah. how all these repressed white people have dealt with their emotions for, you know, 50 years or so. It's just, you just... Just go outside and just mow a lawn about it. Ugh! Interesting. You know. I'm kind of afraid that suicide rates are higher in the suburbs than they are in the inner city. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> there's, again, if, if all you have to do to take out your emotions is mow the lawn, it's not actually the best way to do it. It's it's a, it's an option. It's a supplement to it. But you know, the the other one I always appreciated, um, you know, having also had a, an upbringing in a lot of rural area mm. was uh, the chopping wood to deal with your emotions. Still my favorite. It's a great one, right? Because it's like, I'm mad about a thing. I'm just going to go split some logs about it. Well, you know, I grew up watching slasher movies. Ah, so I'm you. just like, I'm mad about something and I got an axe. Yep. Uh, where's my Shatner mask? <laughs> uh, start playing piano. <laughs> See, I always appreciated that even though... <laughs> Turns out I was also kind of the wimpy kid. Mm -hmm. Who knew? Um, <laughs> despite that, the the physics of swinging an axe overhead kind of mitigate most of the wimpy kidness, and you you may not have the in endurance time. to do it. Yeah, in time. Well, yeah, yeah. but you, you don't have the endurance to do it for a super long amount of time. But if you you know split some logs for a while, it's just the sheer weight of that axe will do your work for you. And then you get tired, you gotta take a break, come back, do it some more, keep working out that aggression, and you yeah. can get a lot done in a uh, in, in an amount of time. Yeah, so. see, now it's like the anger plus the martial arts. So yep. when I'm chopping wood, it is gorgeous. <laughs> it is gorgeous, because I'm out there. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm the exact opposite. It's that that uh, efficient conservation of energy. How much wood can I chop for the least amount of energy? Make game out of it, you know? The answer, C4. With an axe, <laughs> within the confines of this, uh, of this project. You know? Yeah, yeah, because, you know, um, it's, serious, it's, bat, you know, serious, like, you know, hardcore dudes. They walk away from burning buildings and they don't look because they know it's going to burn. No, I sit down and I look. I'm like, ah, yeah. catharsis is beautiful. Yeah, you know. there's, you know, it's like fishing with dynamite. Like, yes, technically it is efficient, but you, you're you missing the forest for the trees. Efficient? Yeah. You, you get a lot of fish. Yeah. Disney, no, no, I, I see we're the pun. in dad joke territory. I, I, see, I see the pun. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about some games. Yeah. Let, actually, let's talk about some other stuff because, again, we're talking about um, we're we're talking about like ways to relieve stress. Yeah. And of course, now that I'm in my 40s and you're in your 30s, and we have to set examples from everybody out yeah. there. You know, what do we do now to relieve stress? And the number one thing that I know you and I have been doing is painting miniatures. Yeah. You know, yeah. painting miniatures and build building terrain and making train sets it's and all that stuff. Extremely therapeutic. You know. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm a huge fan. Yeah, I, 
Um, I'm not. <laughs> well, you're, I'm not. you're you're still coming around to the therapeutic aspect of it, but you're doing it more, and that's the first step to getting to the point where you yeah. really appreciate it. But the second part is enjoying it, and I'm like, eh, not quite there yet. I mean, I didn't start out enjoying it either. Okay, All you right. know, I didn't, I didn't like. I would enjoy sitting down, like, yeah, I'll paint a mini. This is fun. I enjoy this. But the idea of like this is a thing I do to, you know, relieve stress as a major part of my life, and that didn't come till much, much later. Mm. There was a lot of angry miniature painting, gotcha. sitting down. Just I just have to brute force my way through this whole <laughs> unit of mechanothrals because you know what I need them done, and I want to have some zombies on the table that are painted. Dag dang it. Yeah. See, right now I'm like, oh god, I'm so angry. Oh, okay, now I make a drag. If this dragon were real, it would be that. Yep. Oh, I'm using the wrong shade of gold. I want to destroy everything in the world. You know. Um, yep. Fortunately, I'm not a vegetarian. Y'all know. Um, but yeah. Um, but when it comes to that, you know what? There's not a lot of. What's that? Beginning tutorials. Not very many things I would to disagree. say. Well, when I say beginning, I mean bottom tier. Like, um, you know, I, I and I search YouTube, and their beginner tutorials are not for beginners. They always assume that you have some background in miniatures painting. And one of the reasons I was never into miniatures painting was I didn't have much access as a kid. And that, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about today because um, we're online. Yeah. And online is kind of representative of the rest of the world. But when it comes to the, the nerd aspect of things online, there's always this assumption of, you're like me, therefore, you have access to the tools and things that I have access to. Yeah. And as a kid, I really liked making model trains. And I'm like, that's funny, because as a kid, I didn't even know where to get model trains, you know? And speaking of someone who, my dad was an avid model railroader, mm -hmm. so my introduction to the entire concept of hobbying, um, the resources that he had available when he was a kid were vastly different from the resources I had when I was a kid, which are vastly different from the resources now that the internet is a thing. Right. And, you know, my dad grew up with very little in his life as well, but wanted to, you know, make model trains. And so, you know, he would beg, borrow, and steal copies of Model Railroader magazine mm -hmm. and then find... You know, his his dad was a carpenter, so he would like steal the scraps of wood, you know, ah. the sawdust and the discarded trash, and he would you know make terrain out of this with you know school glue and you know just the junk he could find around. He would make stuff based on the tutorials in a magazine, and there is absolutely something to the idea that you can do quite a bit with very little. Cost is not nearly as big of a uh, of a stumbling block as a lot of people end up thinking it is because you know again especially now that we have the internet mm -hmm. um there's one of the channels is like i think called terrain from trash mm -hmm. that i that i follow it's literally like yeah you ever just found a random cardboard box you ever found some discarded packing foam that <sighs> somebody had can you find something resembling a knife cool man we can make this work right like, well well when i'm when i'm talking about like straight beginner okay yeah. i'm talking so you've never done this before. Yeah. And um, again, I, I did a lot of research um, searching YouTube and Twitch mm -hmm. and um, and even Vimo, I think it was. Um, Vimeo. Yeah, Vimeo. I'm looking for Vimeo. And I'm just like, hmm, because there are a lot of there are a lot of things that we in the hobby community mm -hmm. take as red. And what I like to what I like to talk about are essentially the ABCs of what you're doing. Okay. Okay. Um, because <clears throat> there's a lot of it's it's interesting being in such a diverse culture as the United States because everyone believes that since we all speak English, we all have the same idioms, cultures, and um, points of reference. This is true. Okay. Very so, very erroneously uh, yeah. <laughs> assumed. But yes. yes. E exactly. Yeah. And it's like okay, so. Let's take priming, just mm -hmm. priming a miniature. Um, I was working at a comic book store, oh God, back in 2001, mm -hmm. 2002, and um, a friend of mine came over, uh, Matt 
great guy, and he had he had used some um, a particular brand of primer, and it took away a tiny bit of detail on the visor of a twenty eight millimeter figure, mm -hmm. and he was through the roof livid. Okay, and I mean through the roof livid in doing that thing that people do, and they go, look at this, look, can't you see, look. And I'm like, what am I looking at? It killed the detail. W what detail? <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of that. There, there's yeah. a whole lot of that. And um, I'm like, okay, hang on. I don't know what I'm looking at. Yeah. I did, well, didn't you do this as a kid? No, dude. Yeah. The biggest thing I wanted when I was a kid was a trapper keeper. Yeah. And people are like, just get it from Target. There were no Targets where I lived. <laughs> you know, and the people that live in rural areas also go through this. And it's not that the talent for doing it isn't there. Correct. But the base knowledge. So um, after years, because I, I had to learn hard mm -hmm. how to paint. Like, I looked at some tutorials. I looked at stuff. But when you look at tutorials, say, in magazines, mm -hmm. the number one bit of the tutorial you get is a commercial. It really is. It like, depends on the magazine, but generally, yeah, it's a commercial for a product someone is selling. Here's how you start with this thing. Yeah, so it's yeah. like, if you want to learn how to prime, you know, thank you for coming to the... Blah, blah, blah. Um, you want to learn how to prime your army? Well, that's simple. You take blah, 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 brand primer yeah. and you spray, you know? Yeah. But, um, but much like learning a musical yeah. instrument from a video, you get the, okay, so we do this, 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 and this, and now let's try it. Now it's your turn. Yep. Wah, 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 wah. Then you have a Netflix show called Nailed It where yeah. <laughs> you're trying to do it, and it's a, and it well, looks all terrible. The, you know, a lot of the tutorials, because um, I, uh, I spend no small amount of time looking at video tutorials online, as do many of my friends, mm -hmm. and we always joke that that part where, you know, it goes, okay, and so we're just going to take this thing, and we're going to, like, do a little bit of painting, we're going to paint a few details on it, then just, like, camera cuts to, like, it's just beautifully done. Mm -hmm. So we, we call that, uh, that's the part of the video where you just be a wizard. Yeah. And you just, <laughs> you know, like, okay, you're yeah. just doing a thing, okay, now just be a wizard, and we're just going to cut the camera. That's exactly you, it. And you did the <laughs> thing. Congratulations. Like, okay, on the random weird assumption, I'm not a wizard. <laughs> uh, how the heck do I get to this point? Okay, guess what? I am a wizard. <laughs> and when it comes to that point, this is, you call it be a wizard, I say, now be as good as me. Um, there's a great Mitchell and Webb skit that they're making fun of Gordon Ramsay. Okay. Where they're like, um, <clears throat> um, he's just yelling at the dude saying your menu is far too long do this you know fresh fish squeeze a little thing marinate it a bit and he pulls it out and it's this beautifully presented mm -hmm. piece of trout on like this bed of spinach with and yep. he's like but did you you and that thing with the potatoes that may as well be magic you know? yep. and um and that that's kind of what it feels like and Absolutely. it's like what these tutorials don't do is say and again as i was learning I tried learning from a lot of people. Again, our, our friend from ZoloCast, Norm Lau, is one of the best resources that I had. Because oh, yeah. the other ones were like, ink it and dry brush <laughs> it. It'll be good. And I'm like, what's dry brushing? Yep. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you're telling me to use this technique to make something meh better. I need to get to meh. Yeah. You know? And um, so, again, let's, let's, let's talk about that kind of thing. Because one of the things I learned... Like, again, primers. Yes. Primers come in three flavors. Three flavors. There are sandable primers, carpentry primers, and um, and standard primer. Mm -hmm. And the difference with these primers yeah. are, <coughs> quite honestly, the great, or yeah, the grade of the granulation of the mm -hmm. pigment inside the chemical. Yes. Now, this is big. A sandable primer, um, primarily sandable auto primer, is what I really cut my teeth on. Yes. Um, there is it's, what a, it's what a lot of hobbyists will use as a standard yeah. way to prime their miniatures is auto primer. Yeah. Um, so, <coughs> duplicolor primer is a fantastic auto primer. And you don't get this from the hobby store, y'all. You get it from AutoZone. You get it from a car parts store. Yep. And it's or like... Or Home Depot will often carry a lot of good yeah. auto primers. Yeah. Um, now, you'll 
get used to um, Krylon. And if you go to Home Depot, you'll see a whole lot of paint plus primer. And it's like, no, yeah. <laughs> stay away. <laughs> yeah, paint plus primer, having experimented with that, um, the problem is, you know, for those of you who are interested in trying it, um, we just talked about you know the amount of, of the, the size of the particles. They just add the paint and the primer together in the same spray, which means there's a lot of material coming out, and it's going to obscure a lot of the details on your work. Yeah. Now, so, re- now what that essentially means is, let's say you have to paint a statue, like a life-size statue. Yeah. You can use thin paint over and over again, or you can take your house paint, pick it up with a spoon, and just start pouring it over stuff, mm-hmm. and you'll see the difference between details. Yeah. And the... One of the important things on Paint Plus Primer is it does still have a use in hobbying, but not for anything you want to keep the detail on. Right. So if you had, say, some terrain where it's like, look, this is basically a, a relatively flat surface that doesn't have much or any detail to it, man, knock yourself out. Paint mm-hmm. pl- I've done that before. You know, like, you know what? This is a blue building. Paint Plus Ooh. Primer. <laughs> yeah. It's like, cool. Well, that was that entire step, and then I can – you know, do a dry brush highlight and I'm done. All yeah. right, move on. Yeah. You know, and, and if you're, it still has a use, but I think it's one of those things where the, you need to know the tool for the job. And that is the thing that a lot of the online resources are going to fail and, at. And that's exactly what we're talking about today. Yeah. So yeah, um, again, Duplicolor primer. Now, um, it comes in a lot of colors. Gray is standard. I prefer any color primer that's close to the color that you've already picked out. Yes. Um, I, as, as a lot of people know, I played War Machine. Yes. And War Machine, I, I chose the Protectorate of Minoth, and their colors are white, khaki, white-ish. Yeah, And Off-whites. crimson. Yeah. I chose blue because, you know, it's, uh, that's Spice just up. my bag. Make it your dudes. So I learned the hard way that I do not enjoy painting white on top of black primer. Because that's a lot of work. However, I do like priming my figures in white. <laughs> well, let's let's actually back up a step um, okay. because a lot of this actually comes from people not knowing how acrylic paints work. Most oh. miniatures, most miniatures are painted with actually, acrylic paints. That that was going to be for the next segment. Remember the notes that I, I do remember the, paints, the notes, but this is you know. what you're saying is directly applicable to that because one of the key parts of acrylic paint in general is it is a little bit translucent. There's a little bit of see through to the layer below it, so that's why, in general, you are absolutely correct where you want to be starting pretty close to the color you want to be going to because if you're going to be painting white and you're going over black, that translucency means the white paint is going to be showing black through it and it's going to take a zillion layers to get there. If you start white, you're pretty much already there. Or if you're starting even gray, it's going to be easier. Right. So um, now um, that is a fantastic reason to pick this stuff. Now a lot of people do gray as a general principle. Yeah. Gray is... It can go up or down. Yeah, it is the most neutral of neutrals. But... I wanted to get to this next thing. See the segment yeah, no, part. I, I got you. Um, because what's next? Well, again, thinking back to my history growing up, um, there were no hobby shops right. within 20 miles. Um, what we had were Korean-owned swap meets. Mm-hmm. We had drug stores like, well, back in my day it was Thrifty. Y'all know it now as CVS or Walgreens. Right Aid. Um, right Aid, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, they have paints okay mm-hmm. and the two major paints and of course y'all got michael's and hobby lobby mm-hmm. and then you've got amazon <laughs> you know yeah amazon um, has really changed the game as far as hobby supplies are oh concerned. yeah oh yeah because yeah, you're, um, you're paying the same price you would going to the hobby store without the hassle of a trip to the hobby store if you're willing to wait a couple of days yeah but if you are under 18 and you want to spend your own money and you don't have a bank account true you're going to have to walk into the store it's also so true. if you walk into the store whatever store you have there are the different types of paints, and this is why I wanted to wait on talking about acrylics. Yes. Because growing up in public school, we painted, and one of the things that always got on my nerves mm-hmm. was how nothing I painted ever looked right. Yeah. No matter what thing. And then— and no one's going to tell you why it doesn't look right because you can't express why it doesn't look right other than it doesn't look right. And they right. just go, whatever, it's painted. So the three types of paint that we tend to have access to— we grow up with one, 
one primary type of pain that we never use again after we, lo after we leave school. And that is, of course, tempera. Tempera paint is what most of us learn because that's what they keep around schools because it's safe, mm -hmm. you know? And so we grow up using tempera paints and unless you specifically focus on art classes, you're not gonna know the difference. Yeah. And the three types of paints that you'll have access to if you go to Thrifty or, um, or CVS or Michaels are going to be tempera, acrylic, and oil-based. And these are the things that we want to talk about a little bit today. Um, tempera, number one, stay away. Just walk <laughs> away. That's the stuff you use in school. It's like trying to paint your miniatures with crayons. It's just going to be frustrated. Walk away. The number one and most popular, most popular paint out there is testers. Because that's what people <coughs> who do model cars and model ships and all that stuff. Yeah. So whenever you see the model cars in the toy section of Thrifties, you're going to see testers. Mm -hmm. This is oil paint. Right. That is the most difficult paint to work with, period. I would disagree with that. It is very different to work with. And it is the traditional paint that most people so again let's let's back up a second mm -hmm. all paint shares some things in common which is the idea that paint as is as a concept is a pigment suspended in a solution so when mm -hmm. we're talking about oil paint versus acrylic paint the difference there is the solution that it's suspended in the pigments going to be different as well because different pigments mix differently but mm -hmm. it's still going to be a pigment in a solution so a lot of the times you see these different companies and they brand you know Again, testers is mm -hmm. a big one because testers is everywhere. It's you know they do a lot of stuff, but that brand is going to have you know the testers whatever that color is you know so and so gray and they'll often name them with very specific colors or very specific names of the colors so they can trademark that specific blend of pigment into um, into the medium. The oil medium is what's traditionally been used in oil paintings for a zillion years, mm -hmm. you know, because you can mix an oil, mix the, the pigment into it, and when it dries, cool, it's done. It also has an, a specific advantage where the um, you can always reactivate that paint by adding a little bit of paint thinner or a mm -hmm. little bit of something else, and you can you can get the paint liquid again, move it around, and adjust it even after it's dried makes it really good for a lot of model making that does involve like kind of messing around with the stuff after it's Wet dry. blending, yeah, wet blending, mm -hmm. decals, things like that. A lot of that stuff is a lot better when you're using an oil paint. So it's not necessarily harder, but it is different. It's a whole different skill set. Yeah, and it's uh, if you're going for gaming stuff, mm -hmm. it's a skill set that will not, it really won't allow you to get in there and play because it takes so long to do just about everything. Well, it also has a very specific problem mm -hmm. where because you can reactivate that paint, it's a lot easier to rub it off the thing. Even with a coat of sealant over the top of it, mm -hmm. it's much more likely to rub off through constant use. So it's great on a display model, like you say, the model cars that you mm -hmm. see on display. Like, oh, I'm gonna put this thing here and it's gonna be fine. If you're trying to do something with that where you're touching it all the time and moving it all over the board, it's gonna hold up a lot less well if it's an oil paint. Yes, and that was where I was coming from with the yes. don't do it, stay yes. away, it's far. It is not good for playing with. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to the third, since tempera. Stay away. Yeah, <laughs> just, just stay. If you want tempera paint, go to any elementary school and look at the paint that they, they use yes. to play stuff with, okay? Um, and again, the oil-based paints, they are fantastic for art. Yes art hobby and art and there's you know if that's if that is why you've tuned into this channel then that is your bag all the way across the board you know right there i mean um, again there's it's different different tools for different jobs mm -hmm. um the the oil paints are good for some kinds of art mm -hmm. not all kinds and that's kind of what we're getting at yeah here. now that brings us to our just right guy or do it in the middle, yep. acrylic. Yeah. Now, this is really important. <clears throat> One, spray cans, not for not for the paint stuff, not at the beginning, yeah. okay? Not at the beginning, because you're dealing with things on tiny, tiny, tiny scales, yeah. like 1 16th, or, si or sizes A through F, or um, 
28 millimeter, 32 millimeter. Mm -hmm. All these things are different scale, but all it means and, is... And to, to explain that to those in the audience who don't know, the scale is basically how how much of a fraction of reality that miniature is. Right. So, you know, some miniatures are going to be obviously miniature, but if a person is this big, the amount of detail you're fitting on that is a lot different from if the person is this big. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so most miniatures for most miniature games, including... Oh, wait, hang on. <laughs> uh, most miniatures for most miniatures games are going to be somewhere around the 30 millimeter range 25 to 32 to yeah you know, somewhere in there and what that means is basically a human sized figure ends up being about this big which is again we're looking at stuff like hero clicks we're looking at um, most of the warhammer si yeah, style miniatures pretty much most of the miniatures games that you're going to find on the market that aren't historical recreation Correct. Most historical games are even smaller. They're going to be something like <laughs> yeah. 15 millimeter, or in some cases of some games, they're two millimeter, where a human is just this big, little, little, tiny. Yeah. And what you do then, you know, again, the scale matters differently in the games because a little, little, tiny guy, you can't get a lot of detail at all on something that big, but you can get hundreds of them on the table. Yeah. Which, if you're playing, again, a historical game where you're recreating the Battle of the Somme or something, and you need to have thousands and thousands of miniatures to represent this battle, you may want to have a little tiny guy so that your battle can take place on a table and not an actual battlefield. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. So, um, now there are a couple of brands out there that are different places to start, okay? Um, we've got... Two hobby industry standards, which you can always find on Amazon. Um, and then we've got the stuff that you might actually find if you walk into, say, say a Michaels or a stuff. Yeah. So, you know, I wanted to talk about some of the pros and cons of each one. Okay. Um, one of the things <laughs> that you brought up last week was Apple Barrel. Apple yes. Apple Barrel Acrylics. Or um, there's some, several similar brands to it, but... You all know them if you go into kind of your generic. I mean, even even. Uh, oh yeah, here we got them right here. Yeah. Um, so if you go into uh, Walmart or if you're going into, you know, Michaels or Joann's or Hobby Lobby, they're all gonna have a section of their super cheap acrylic paints, and um, the the big thing about acrylic paints in general is that when they dry, uh, the medium that the pigment is suspended in, is uh, it's gonna polymerize. It's going to turn into basically a plastic, a colored plastic that um, will no longer be reactivated. Unlike oil paints, you can never go back and reactivate that paint to do something else with it. So all acrylic paints share that feature where when they dry, they dry exactly the way they are. So the apple barrel paints are very cheap. Yeah, you know, and I say apple bear. I'm using that in general for all the types of paints that, that fall into that category. And so what that means, why they are so cheap, is that the quality of the pigment and the quality of the medium are both lower quality. Um, so it's more um, not quite poorly made. It's just... No, it, it's um, made to the to a fine standard for what it is, but you're using lower quality ingredients. If you, use, you, you, you make a, a meal with lower quality ingredients you're going to get a lower quality meal it's not to say the meal itself is bad or not good for what you're trying to do with it but you know if you're if you're getting some kind of you know rotten fruit to start with it's just not going to have the same quality as like oh beautiful fresh cut whatever mm -hmm. so apple barrel paints are used for common crafting stuff because they are cheap and while they don't capture detail especially well, at the scale of most arts and crafts stuff that you're going to be doing as the average consumer, they're fine. If you wanted to like buy one of those pre-made birdhouses from Michaels or something, <laughs> and you wanted to paint it, by all means, use some apple barrel paint. That stuff is cheap. It's going to go on. It's going to, you know, may take a couple of layers, but it's going to look fine. The stuff usually comes out of the tube looking like paste. Yeah. You know. Well, it, it does the job, but what it's not going to do is capture detail in these tiny miniatures. Yeah. So um, now the the second bit, you know, you get um, so we've talked about testers, which is the standard. I like to call it the Honda Civic of oils. Yeah. And much. Apple Barrel is kind of like the Toyota Camry of acrylics, and then you'll get access to a hundred different brands if you go online. Um, you have things like um, the two biggest ones. Um, 
Games Workshop paints. Yep. And Reaper paint. Yep. Those are. And um, now we're we're getting to the specialty hobby paints at this point. Ah, uh, yeah, for yeah. the people that have access to internet ordering. Um, or hobby shops that sell them. Yeah, but hobby yeah. shops, hobby shops that sell them and stuff. Um, and these are the things where it's like, okay, this is where you go. Um, this is the things you start with. And both companies sell great starter kits. Oh yeah. Just, just. Oh yeah. Oh, are you new? These are the things you need. Here's a flesh tone. Yep. Um, here is here are your primary colors. Yep. <laughs> and here's your other stuff. I was trying to explain this. Um, I had a friend recently get into painting, mm -hmm. and um, I had an extra starter set because I've reached a point in my life where people just give me stuff like, oh, I'm getting out of the hobby. Here, just take all this stuff. Like, I yeah. don't need another starter set. <laughs> so anyway, gave the starter set away to try and spread the love and, yeah. and and try to get someone else into the hobby. And one thing I realized was that I've become very spoiled with the fact that you, you stay in the hobby long enough, you get this huge amount of all these different colors to do everything. But that starter set, you can absolutely make any color because you get your primary colors, your mm -hmm. white, your black, some basic flesh tones, some browns, some all the basic building blocks you need technically if you are a proficient or a skilled enough painter you can mix those to do whatever you want now right. that being said it's a lot easier to just have a paint the exact color you want <laughs> but if you are if you are uh strapped for money as many of our viewers are likely to be you can take one of these base sets and with enough practice get to stand up and do all the tricks you need it to do right um now one of the things that i've come to do like again we've got you know Things like this, and th these are what they're going to be looking like um, in times, just tiny little things. Now, what I've come to do is, like, when I go to Michael's and stuff, since I know I'm looking for acrylic paint, okay, yeah. I'm looking for acrylic, I go to their paint section, and I get these guys, okay? Yep. These guys. Notice how it says, ba oh, <laughs> <laughs> basics, yep. you know, because, yeah, when it comes to painting, I so have resting basic face. Um and these things will last for a long, 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 long time, um, especially when it comes to my primary colors mm -hmm. and my two shades, i.e. red, blue, yellow, and um, black and white. Now, <coughs> the, these are really important things because you're only using maybe one or two literal drops yeah. <coughs> at a time. And um, when it comes to acrylic paint, since you can cut it with, acrylic medium if you're all fancy or you know water, water. <laughs> exactly well and there's there's an important reason to do one of, of one of the uh, one yeah, or the like other they, they get different effects and you can do different things with cutting with medium versus water mm -hmm. but yeah for especially when you're starting out you just cut it with some water it thins that paint out and like you say that can last a really long time i've been in this hobby for 12 13 years something like that in mm -hmm. terms of my active miniature painting and i'm still using some of the pots of paint i got 12 or 13 years ago because you take care of your paints and you don't use a lot of them in some cases now obviously the colors i've used a lot of i've had to get new pots of right and used them all up but like that little tiny amount like this let, let me get one of these pots here mm -hmm. like like a pot of paint this big this is, this is a small pot of paint you go like well this is not hardly anything at all but a pot of paint like this will last you for a decade or more if you're taking care of it and you're doing, you know, doing a small amount of stuff. Because you use a tiny, you know, a brush full, uh, you know, like a mm -hmm. drop or two, as you yeah. said, and thin it with a little bit of water. And that'll paint most of that color on an entire miniature. Yeah. Um, again, the, these are um, these are some of um, some of the big things when it comes to the hobby aspect of, of dealing with stuff. So what have we gone over? We've gone over primer, sandable primer. We recommend Duplicolor or some kind of fine sandable primer. You can always try and go for the name brands like Games Workshop or Reaper or... Which, to be fair, if you can afford them, are better products. And when we say can afford them, those are $15, $16 for a, a spray can. can. Yeah, okay. single, one, single round. One regular old spray can, $15, $16. Bucks where the Duplicolor Sandable Primers or the Sandable Auto Primers that you can get from AutoZone mm -hmm. and Home Depot and places that are in your neighborhood yeah. are six to eight. Or so less. The, I mean, yeah. you, can, you can get, um, a lot of times from Home Depot, you can get a can of paint for like three, four bucks that'll do most of your priming needs. And well, it's... I'm specifically talking about the, the brands that we're talking mm. about. These, yeah. Like yeah. the Duplicolor... Um, Krylon Sandable Primer, eh, I use it, 
um, because I have it for bigger projects. And as a beginner, as like very first level, where when you're sanding or when you're priming, you don't even know to use to move your hand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When you think priming is this, we'll get into that in the next part or in the next time we cover this subject. Um, you know, the sandable primer like Duplicolor um, and all the colors that it comes in. Um, those are that is the place to start, like the main right. place to start, and I'm, because I'm a it's easily for, accessible. For Rust-Oleum brand mm -hmm. versus, prime. but you know, it ends up being the same thing. So don't I, I don't want people to think that like you you have to get a specific brand of you know the stuff from Home Depot. Like it's worth trying. You know, Krylon's good, Rust-Oleum's good. Um, it's good to try out if you can afford to make mistakes. So Fair I enough. say Fair take enough. that next step and jump past the house paint go directly to the auto primer yeah it's another two dollars you can do that That's fair. i know you can That's do fair. that um because that other two dollars will keep you from having to take simple green dishwashing liquid or heaven forbid acetone and a few toothbrushes and scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing your mini yeah. so that you can start over um, yeah that's true you know or throwing away your mini because you just messed it all up yeah um and if you're in Michael's or Hobby Lobby or even your local drugstore that sells paint, if you're just starting out, start with acrylic. Just ask yeah. them for small pots of acrylic paint so that you can thin them with water. And once it dries, it dries. However, you can wash it off easily. Yes. You know? and, and generally the... Um when we say wash it off, it's you need to, like you said, you have to strip that paint. And there's a number of things you can do for that. Simple green is my favorite because mm -hmm. it's cheap. It's readily accessible. I'm a um, big fan of fingernail polish remover yes. because it's around. I, yeah, if you have that, my big gripe with that is always it's really stinky. And so mm. it's you, you need to have a well-ventilated area. You need less of that with simple green. But, mm -hmm. yeah, there's uh, you can actually use plain rubbing alcohol. Um, true. Isopropyl alcohol will actually strip miniatures just fine. True. Very true. So um, these are things that um, even our most economically challenged viewers will already have in their house. Yeah. Or and can that, get cheap. I mean, like a yeah. bottle of isopropyl alcohol is, is not dollar. expensive. No, yeah. It's a it, dollar. It's very easy to get. You know. um, and some of them work better than others, but if you are looking to cut costs, you're probably just going to want to go with something on the cheap side and then deal with the fact that it may not be as good and compensate for that in other non-monetary ways right um so as as we're talking about this um we're looking at some of the, you know we're, we're getting this basic idea of what you need to just show up and paint a thing get into this hobby at all so we got some some cheap pri primer you're looking at like say six to eight bucks yeah um and if i'm being entirely honest i started out my painting career on apple barrel paints mm -hmm. and you know what those miniatures are not outstanding but they are painted <laughs> they still have paint yes. on them you know so like if you're looking to just dip your toes in the water for a really laughably small amount like you can do something like that where it's fit you know 40 50 cents a bottle and you can go ahead and try it out. Mm -hmm. The big reason I like that is if you keep with it and you go, yeah, man, I, I really like this miniature painting thing, but I don't necessarily love the quality I'm getting. You know, again, that same thing you were talking about when mm -hmm. you were a kid. You're like, I don't know why this doesn't look the way I want it to look. It's probably because your paint sucks. But <laughs> don't throw away. And my technique did. Well, <laughs> yes, but I'm saying you can learn better techniques, but it made a huge difference for me when I switched – when I had learned better techniques on bad paint and then suddenly switched to better paint, it was like, oh, my goodness. It's, it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. Um, now, um, one of the things that um, I do want to bring up as the last part of this hobby aspect yeah. is, you know, we've been talking about this for about an hour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, is your miniature choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, here's the big thing. You always, and we talk about expectation management a lot on this channel. All right. Um, when you're looking for a miniature, especially just to start, most miniatures will do. Okay. And yeah, fortunately, absolutely. you know, fortunately, there are three brands. If you have access to a game store, um, you've got what I like to call the two most basic, basic starters, which is the WizKids D&D miniatures. Yep. Because one, they come pre-primed. Yep. And two... You get two of them 
for $5. Yeah, it's an um, outstanding deal for testing out whether you even like the hobby. Yeah, um, and second, our company, our company that we have been doing miniatures from for 20 years, and we didn't even know they had a game to go along with their miniatures, Reaper. <laughs> they have. I mean, I knew they had a game. I just never cared. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, they, um, yeah it, Reaper has been like the number one miniatures manufacturer in the hobby for ever and of course 10 years ago they released reaper bones it has which has been 10 oh god it's almost been 10 years yeah yeah uh, <laughs> uh, um so ready for them dad jokes uh, <laughs> um sorry, yeah, my, my released, dark night of the soul is is yeah, yeah anyway. they released what are known as the bones um yeah. line which is hey do you like all of our miniatures that we've been doing in pewter for the past 20 years? Yeah. Well, how would you like a $2 version of them in plastic? Yeah. And, <laughs> and a lot um, of these miniatures that were in metal before were not expensive either. You know, they were 8 to $10 for a miniature, which to get the exact miniature you want for your D&D guy, it's not a huge investment. No, if you're not, If you're playing an really. Elven Ranger and you want to get into this game, sure, drop 8 bucks on getting an Elven Ranger. Yeah. However, if you're new to the hobby and you don't know what yep. you want, Drop two bucks on something. Yep. Go, hey, that thing looks cool. And that's exactly I will do I exactly that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of the, for, you know, when you're creating miniatures, there's, some companies do it in all these different materials, and the reason for that is different materials have different costs. Mm -hmm. Metals are great for doing short-run miniatures, where, you know, you're only running off a few of these miniatures, the molds are cheap, and the material is cheap enough that you can, you know, do a short, but if you're making a huge line, you can't do that. But Reaper mm -hmm. was like, nah. We're going to get these much more expensive molds and put this incredibly cheap plastic in it mm -hmm. so we can make up in volume what we're doing. So you're paying two bucks. They're still making money hand over fist. Oh, yeah. just probably cost them a couple of pennies per miniature to make. Yep. And they, at this point, <laughs> at this point, they've definitely recovered the cost of the molds given <laughs> the, the wild success of their Kickstarters. Yeah, they did that on Kickstarter a long yeah, time ago. Which uh, it allowed them to propel their entire business model into the fact that they can make profit a significant amount of profit selling two dollar miniatures yeah. which is i mean it's changed the entire way companies are looking at this whole product you were you were showing me um that that dungeon tile kit that was made in the same pvc plastic mm -hmm. that those reaper bones are made out of where it's a softer plastic but it looks fine yeah. like it's, it's it not does the, highest, the job yeah it's not the highest quality miniatures but it never pretends to be and it allows you to get in for a just laughably low initial price point to get that plastic in your hands mm -hmm. so that you can then go ahead yeah and, no oh, no just keep talking uh, i was gonna say i, uh, I think your yeah, camera's the go. wrong one there but anyway um this laughably cheap interest I entry price point so that you can actually start playing a game with some terrain some monsters some miniatures for your dudes all at this absolutely ludicrously low price point Right. Um, you know, two dollars for a miniature, twenty bucks for a thing of terrain, and you've got this amazing, beautiful quality thing that, yeah. you know. Now, what I'm showing the crowd right now is um, this right here, this little monster, because I'm a big fan of beholders. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the, of beholders, not as much as a whole lot of other people, but yeah, check this guy out. Oh, he's a model. This is a bones miniature that I got. I haven't painted him yet, but um, I put some primer on him because you know. Yeah. May as well get it primed. Might as well. But yeah, this little monster guy. Now that guy literally was three dollars. Yep. Three dollars, and it's got a bunch of details and stuff that I don't know are coming out. I'm checking out the monitor and stuff. But yeah, it's there, and um, and it's got a lot of things I can do with it. And literally, it came out of the box in the Reaper Bones white. <laughs> yep. You know, or, as a single piece sculpt. Yeah, there yeah. we go. Yeah, there we go. And um, yeah, and I threw a coat of the primer and stuff on it, and this will take me not long to paint because I don't care about detail. But <clears throat> it's there. It's a monster thing. Um, eventually, um, and again, the next time we get into this hobby thing, we're going to be talking about brushes mm -hmm. because that's what you have to pay attention to. Because a good yeah. brush will do a whole bunch more uh -huh. than the brushes that most people think they have access to. Here's a hint. You know those plastic brushes you get with the pots of paints when you're at the Dollar Tree? Not those. Yeah. And those 50 cent brushes you can get from Ace Hardware? Not those either. Yeah. To, to <laughs> be fair, I started out my 
painting hobby, like I say, mm-hmm. apple barrel paints mm-hmm. and like, you know, the big plastic bag full of cheap brushes from Walmart, like oh, no, those are fine. Those I'm, are fine. What I'm talk those are fine to start. What I'm saying yeah. is um, there are these little brushes that literally are plastic and they look like they have wires and they're more like, oh, bru- those. Yeah, 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 you yeah. know no, those. No, no, yeah. Not those, not those. See, now we're on the same page. Now we're on the same page. And those 50 cent yeah. brushes, um, let's see if I have one here. Um, now, the 50 cent brushes that you can get from Ace Hardware or um, uh, Home Depot, mm-hmm. they're great for dry brushing. Yes. And nothing else. Or terrain painting. Yeah. Again, terrain is a it's a little bit of a different beast because you're painting something that requires less detail, but you want to paint it maybe faster because you don't want to spend a bunch of time painting something that has less detail. So you exactly. actually want kind of a crappy brush to cover huge amounts of this thing and be done with it. Now this is interesting because over in NP City, I bet y'all forgot. I bet y'all thought I forgot about you. <laughs> um, Camo Heart is actually um, making a really good point with its. Oh, it's the same with makeup, and it's yes. like yeah. Makeup yes. is nothing but painting a living face. Yes. yes. Um, and a lot of the thing now, some of the tools go over. Um, some of the tools actually translate yeah. um, between miniatures and makeup. I've learned that from special effects guys over yeah. the years. But um, but the truth is, yeah, a lot of the the physics don't change. Mm-hmm. The principles don't change. And as if a, you are brand new to this hobby and didn't really have access to it as a kid, like me and a lot of a lot of our rule guys out there mm-hmm. um, think about paint a car mm-hmm. paint a house you know um, five thin layers is better than one thick one always yep. and you gotta have you gotta have decent brushes again one of those packs of five or six brushes a better place to start off with than those 50 cent chip brushes yep. um, as you get better well the more you do it the better you get and the more you do it, the more you want to make your tools better. Mm-hmm. You know, we can, one, yeah. one thing I wanted to say before we got off the, the, the subject Camo Hart was talking about, in my experience, every time um, I've known a woman who got into miniatures painting, they always start out at a significantly higher skill level than mm-hmm. any guy because, again, makeup. male painting and makeup – are very closely related to miniatures painting in terms of the basic skills. I mean, nails, very, very nails much are so. acrylic. Yeah, Nail very, paint is acrylic. Very much so. And not to mention because of having a much better understanding of color theory. Yep. And years more practice of looking for details and knowing what to highlight and what not. Exactly. You knowing know? like the very basics of like, oh, the reason I'm doing this eyeshadow is to create a shade to bring out these other features. Yes. That's something most guys haven't the foggiest concept of when they're starting this. Well, we know blue. We don't yeah. know duck egg. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's the other thing. You know, is, you know the, the running joke of like, oh, you know, for a guy – this is blue. Mm-hmm. And then for a woman, like, this blue splits off into, like, ten different shades. A hundred different shades. Right. And, and you know, it's, the, ah. Then, the, you know, the following is like, oh, yeah, that's great. Until you're an experienced miniatures painter. Then it's a thousand different, you know. Where it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, this is not just blue. This is a McCrag blue. This is a subtly <laughs> shade, you know, subtly different. This is ultimate. a McCrag blue with a duck egg highlight. Right. And you oh, can yeah. tell that. There. Hey guys, how you guys doing? This is Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Um, Wow. So, all right. So I know, I know we're 10 minutes late. I get, I get where you're coming from on that. But as the man was saying, I am Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer. And I'm saying, hey guys, welcome to the game gallery. 
Um, again, it, it's a weird thing, but first I'd like to introduce my illustrious co-host. The Duggernaut. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's where... Ooh, let me see if I can get you... Oh. Get you a little less slouchy. Oh, yeah, I, I can probably also just slouch yeah. less. Yeah, that works. That might help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're sitting up here and we're like, yeah, hey, you know, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, God, it's Sunday morning. Yeah, Sunday morning yeah. and we're, we're like here doing a thing. It's it's very different from Sunday morning where you may just want to be lounging around. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, we got some stuff lined up for you today. That we do. Yeah, I mean... Uh, of course, this is the game gallery where we talk about games, um, hobbies, aspects. We try and focus on types of games here in the gallery, um, not particular games, because I wanted to do that. I really wanted to. Mm -hmm. But you know what I learned? As soon as people start talking to someone who actually has a platform, people want to take over the platform. They're like, this is my favorite game, and you should dedicate three and a half months of broadcast to my favorite oh, game. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, Not that I don't that. want to, but I, I just I don't have the access to doing that. Um, got some exciting stuff coming out. We've had some. We've had a couple of pretty awesome movies hit um, hit the theaters this Friday. I speak, of course, about two new superhero movies. I'm so out thing. of the loop. I, th this kid thing has destroyed my popular culture. <laughs> artist, so hey. tell me as if I have no idea what is going on because I have no idea what's going on. What's <laughs> it out? Um, well, this weekend, a movie I've been looking forward to a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Aquaman. Oh, yes. Aquaman I didn't hear that one was it. coming out. Yeah, yeah. Aquaman. Aquaman. Yeah, because I think I'm looking at Aquaman. It's, it's one of yeah. those things. Um, and um, we got good old Jason Momoa. Doing mm -hmm. the whole look at me, I swim a lot, and I'm a bro <laughs> who's swimming after a redhead. Woo! Yeah, you know. Um, I mean, he's he's a good looking dude. Yeah, yeah, he is, he is. But um, it's funny. Um, we'll we'll get into that a little while because I, I wanted to talk about um, a little bit of art instead of um, focusing on exit this week. I wanted to focus on a couple of things I see in TV right. and movies and game art. Which is which is an interesting thing, um, but you know, back to that though. Yeah, so Jason Momoa was hot. We know. Yeah, we I mean, know. We know he's death row. He's been hot since Stargate Atlantis. <laughs> um, you know, he's just he's a great big beautiful Polynesian man once again who I'll never look like. Um, <laughs> but um, and the second movie that came out was the CGI adventure of. Spider-Man into the spider I heard about this. I, yeah. yeah, I didn't realize it came out this weekend. But yeah, yeah, it came out yesterday. E everybody's been hyped on this movie coming out. Now It looks cool. Yeah, not going to lie. I wanted to go see it. The thing is, it came out on Friday at Christmas break. Yeah. So there ain't even matinee tickets open in my town. Yeah. <laughs> They're just like, yeah, oh, yeah, Spider-Man into the... I'll, I'll see it in a few weeks. It's, it's cool. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah, that's just my life anymore, whether or not the movie's sold out. Yeah, I'll, I'll see it in a few weeks. And then a few weeks turns into, oh, hey, it's on Netflix. <laughs> Which is always depressing when it's like, oh, hey, that movie that I wanted to see in theaters is... Uh, I see the DVD in Target now. Yeah. Cool. Well, I wildly miss that train. Hey, welcome to adulthood. Yeah. Um, one thing I will say, and this is, this is a really funny thing, is as you get older... Okay, um, I, I started thinking about this because, you know, um, I've got my issues as far as that stuff goes. But one of the things that I have come to notice is um, parents don't get what their kids do. They really don't. You know why? I mean, uh, you have to explain the statement first before I can answer well, that. Well, kids learn from other kids. And, sure. you know, that that's the number one thing. And since kids learn from kids and people learn stuff in their own environment, um, we're not part of that environment. So, oh, yeah. The, the part where we're just out of touch all the time? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And oh, as yeah. I get older, I see myself falling further and further and further yeah. away. Now, mine's in college. Yeah. So they use these emojis and, and stuff. They were like, Careful, oh, yeah. man. You're going to... <laughs> Seriously, like there was um there was one moment where it was like blah blah blah. Oh yeah, that song is Bop. I'm like Bop. Yeah. That that is. I mean, 
I kind of get it since it's kind of from the origin of bebop and stuff. So I'm guessing that is um, that is not a pejorative phrase, but it is a positive idiom of which you are you are showing admiration for something. You know, and my ears got really pointed. So yeah, <laughs> I just ugh, um, I've I've always been quite versed in internet culture, mm-hmm. um, even compared to most people my age. But the fact that the internet culture is leaving me behind, I'm just like, oh, geez, I just, I can't right now. I can't even <laughs> deal with the fact that the slang is changing in so many ways. Um, and I'm sure it's always been this way. I'm sure this is the, the progression. Therefore, becomes a new subject, verb, object. So we have subject, verb, object. Mike rides his bike to the store for candy. Contradiction. There's no candy at the store. Therefore, Mike, subject, mm-hmm. must do, <laughs> verb, something, something else. else. Subject, yeah. yeah, exactly. Travel to another store. There you go. New right. object or, you know. You know, whatever. so um, so what we're sitting at, okay, is um, subject, verb, object equals drama, dramatic narrative, and this moves things forward. Now, how else do we do this? Well... We have, and one of my favorite things, subject, verb, object, plus subverted narrative expectation that leans toward the absurd. Okay. I know it sounds weird, okay? Subverted narrative expectation that leans toward the absurd. I'll say that again. Subverted narrative expectation that leans toward the absurd. So, subject, verb, object... Um, go for it. Kids on bikes, go. Kids on bikes. Uh, so the local kids... Uh, Subject. Yeah. yeah. Um, ride their bikes uh, to the edge of town uh, to find out uh, where the strange glowing lights are coming from. Okay. So subject, verb, object. Kids ride to the edge of town to find out what the strange glowing object is. Yeah. Now, from there, we have an expectation. It could be a football field. It could be aliens. It could be something, right? Yeah. So we have an expectation. We have that once the kids get there, they're going to find something that we expect, either something that follows the rules of the universe that we've set up or something that we're already used to. That is the narrative expectation. Okay. Now, if we subvert that narrative expectation toward the absurd, then we get either weird or comedy. Okay. Okay? So, kids go to the edge of town to find out where the strange lights are coming from. They find a circus run by monkeys who ride tigers. Pretty absurd. All right. (laughs) Okay? Now, they have monkeys that ride tigers. So now, new subject, um, therefore, what do they do? Fair enough. Okay. Okay. Um, if one of them says, dude, monkeys aren't supposed to ride tigers. So Ralph, subject, says, verb, monkeys aren't supposed to ride tigers. Object, monkeys riding tigers. All right. That gives a new subject, verb, object. Now, do we go dramatic? As in Planet of the Apes, where monkeys go... And humans aren't supposed to tell us what to do, destroy them. Or do we subvert that expectation and go in a comedic, absurd manner where the monkeys say, you're absolutely right, and the tigers start riding them? Hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I'm definitely less of a fan of the comedic absurdity, but I can definitely see where if you have... A group where that is kind of the the expectation that you know that things can be ridiculous and we're all on the same page. That again, you, you kind of cover that in your session zero. As mm-hmm. yeah, you know, for for kids on bikes, I'm struggling with the idea because that would not be how I'd want to play my kids on bikes game specifically. But I can absolutely see that using this and going to an absurd place with a lot of other games. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> we've got poor Mythos going. I think my head spun with that. Oh my god. <laughs> um. But yeah. Um. But we're just talking about the flavors yeah. of but and therefore. And the two um, flavors I chose to talk about were dramatic tension and absurd comedy. Yeah. Um, 
Now, if you add pain, because all comedy results in someone getting hurt. Yep. It, it has never been any other way, because <laughs> laughing has always been a defense mechanism against discomfort. Check your Psych 101 textbooks. <laughs> um, so if you're laughing at something, somebody has gotten hurt, and you're trying to cope with it. Yeah. Um, so just keep that whole thing in mind, such as monkeys that are now being ridden by tigers – Think about the weight differential and how many monkeys are going to get crushed by tigers. Um, it's funny if you're not a monkey. It's true. Like my friends always ask, like, wait, you don't do that drinking thing. Well, I'm like, I don't like getting drunk. Well, why don't you like getting drunk? Ask a glass of water. <laughs> um, you know, because a glass of water will tell yeah. you why getting drunk yeah. is a bad thing. Um, so, yeah, so when you think about um, your plot lines and your premises, the subject verb object used in a but and therefore manner um, will allow you to really expand on things, especially as a GM. As a GM, yeah. you've got the subject verb object thing going, and you have the subject verb object of your party mm -hmm. and the subject verb object of the story that you've written outside of your party, i.e. the antagonist. Yeah. You know, the wizard that's trying to take over the world, um, the army of orcs mm -hmm. that are trying to fight for their rights on the other side of Middle Earth, um, the lions that want to take over Pride Rock. Um, you know, you have their story, and there is a but and therefore in everything that they do. You mm -hmm. know, Scar wants to be the king on Pride Rock, but Mufasa is very much alive and he's better at the job. Therefore, yep. <laughs> You know, so, um, yeah, Scar's story is certainly uh, easy to see the villainous angle of it, but you could also tell that story using the exact same storytelling tools. Therefore, um, yeah. you can always think of things in a different way. So, yeah, um, that is those are some of the things. And again, flavoring comedy is the unexpected plus the absurd plus pain. Yeah. You know, pain from something. Sorry to tell you, you know, just, yeah, no, I mean, but think about true. anything that you guys have ever laughed at and tell me who didn't get hurt in the joke. Yep. You know, again, why was six afraid of seven? Seven, eight, nine. Poor eight and nine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that situation sucks for eight, nine and ten because seven is crazy, you know. <laughs> but yeah, eight and nine, they get hurt. And we laugh at that because we go, oh, my God, poor situation. I need to not crumble under this tension, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, you know, the, what jumps to my mind is, you know, if you're watching even something like Monty Python's flying circus, where it's just absurd, absurdity, absolutely absurd. But a lot of that absurdity is based around something where people should be getting hurt, but maybe aren't for one reason or another. And that absurdity is in itself funny. The subverting of the expectations. Yeah. Like, with the Spanish Inquisition. Bring him the comfy chair! Yeah, you, know? you expect a torture device, but they bring a comfy chair. Is the comfy chair actually a torture device? Is this person going to be hurt in the comfy chair? No, it's actually just a very comfy chair. And you yeah. ask, where is the suffering? And the answer is, your expect the Inquisition is the thing that's suffering. The idea of the Inquisition yeah. gets hurt in the sense of the Inquisition was painful confessions yes so when they're rubbing someone's feet going confess <laughs> you know the idea of the inquisition is what is being damaged in this joke right so you know you can get obscure with it as much as you want just make sure that your audience i.e your players um and the people that you're trying to entertain can understand where you're going with it because it's not that jokes go over people's heads. I don't like that phrase because no. it makes people feel low. No. But jokes definitely do land in different neighborhoods. <laughs> yes, very much so. Um, and this is something that a lot of um, a lot of my friends, as generally suburban white guys, mm -hmm. um, who are the majority of gamers, uh, despite all of our efforts to continue to expand that. Uh, they still represent a sizable majority, and most of them are not malicious people, but right. they are generally uh, not thinking about a lot of the things that are going to end up hurting someone else. And so, a joke to them that is just a oh, whatever it's a, you know it, by simply not thinking about it and not understanding the underlying reasons for it ends up hurting someone that they certainly didn't mean to and probably didn't want to, 
but here we are, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and do you repair the damage, or do you try and repair your own reputation? Hmm. Yeah, well, that's... <laughs> a different a subject personal, for a different show. Yeah, and that yeah. depends a lot on the person in question. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, the... There's a, man, I'm just really excited to like play more role-playing games now. And I, <laughs> I have no time to do it, um, or at least let me rephrase that. The time that I have to do it does not line up with the time my friends have to do it, which is an important part of role-playing. Um, Ooh, howdy. Yeah. So for me, I, I want to do that. I just, the whole button therefore thing, the realization I had that that entire line of thinking is built into the dice mechanic for Edge of the Empire, and that's why I like that game so much. <laughs> I was just like, oh my god, it's perfect. Like, no wonder I love this game. It, it makes this entire thing we've been talking about just part of the underlying mechanics of the game, and it works phenomenally. Right. Every action you do has a, I want to do this, but, well, therefore, <laughs> it's like it's built into that that single dice roll, you mm -hmm. know? Well, uh, I want to shoot that stormtrooper, but uh, because I generated a bunch of disadvantage on it, along with my success, I do shoot the stormtrooper, but I also shoot the panel behind him and the door closes behind him, and now I'm trapped in here. Okay, <laughs> well, that was a single die roll, and every action has that, that line of consequence to it. It's not even a, a major story thing that you need to think about because it's built, that tension and release is built into every single action, and mm. it works so well. Yeah, so, you know, that that's one of the things. And um, But um, that's our time. <laughs> that is our time. Well, yeah, we, we could talk ad nauseum, I think, about this. Like I said, well, I'm, I'm excited to get back into a lot of the, the role-playing stuff, just what we've talked about last week and this week. Right. Well, um, with that, though, I want to thank you for showing up. And I'm going to say, you guys, tune in to us next week at 1130 because we're going to be talking about legacy games, um, and disposable games because mm. there's a new trend of disposable games out there you buy yeah. it once you play it you throw it away it's a little weird but we're going to get into that next week yep um but thank you for showing up Absolutely, of course man. you know and i want to thank all you guys over in np city you know hashtag deck mob yep and um you know, if you guys have any questions or anything based on the stuff that we are talking about or have any other ideas, um, hit us up. You can totally, totally, totally um, email me or email us. Oh, yeah, that's right. Hello, segues. You can totally email <laughs> us at backinthedeck at gmail.com. Uh, that's B-A-C-K-I-N-T-H-E-D-E-C-K -E -E at gmail.com. Um, check out our archive on YouTube. I've been putting up more stuff from the archive, yeah, although the editing bay has been coughing. Um, but, you know, still working at it, still plugging away, trying, you know. Um, there will come the time where we upgrade the, the editing equipment and all that stuff but in order to do that ah oh ah, my god oh, this is terrible um yeah but in order to do that um again we're gonna need a lot more support so um you know like subscribe and all that stuff on youtube follow us on twitter at back in the deck .com. join deckers on the book talk to each other you can even throw us ideas of what to talk about on what show on what days um listen to our audio stuff on soundcloud at um at soundcloud slash um, BID underscore P. Follow us on Instagram. I'm working on a Discord thing that we're going to be, um, you know, because everybody that I talk to in real life is going, you got a Discord and all that stuff. And I'm just like, man, you guys are going to make my ending segment so big. Um, also working on getting the Patreon up and going so that we can start um, with some income and get some of the really good equipment that we're going to need to do all this stuff up and going. Um, specifically like editing bays with higher RAM capacity. That'll be nice. Um, and um, like I said, we got the archive going up. Um, I'm doing more stuff on the road. We're really trying to get coffee and conversation up and going, so we're going to be doing that. But join us tomorrow on Buster Recap, where we're going to be talking about, um, I believe it's um, Cloak and Dagger um, Season 1, Episode 4. We're also going to be talking about <coughs> Daredevil Season 3, Episode 4. And um, and just remember, if anybody tells you that you can't have the hobbies you like because of the circumstances of your birth, be it race, religion, creed, gender identity, sexual preference, your disabilities, 
your budget and your economic state, you can just tell those people to take those cards and put them back in the deck. This is Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer, along with the Duggernaut. And we will see you guys next week on the Game Gallery. Yeah.